Setting it up on YouTube Live. I think we're live. Perfect. We are live. Hello and welcome, everybody, to Get Leads That Matter with Persona Marketing. Uh, I'm Dave, and my partner in crime, as always, Trigvi, is with us as well. Hey, Trigvi. Hey, Dave. Thanks for letting me uh, tag along once again. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I see that we have our attendees joining and uh, and popping on. So Cynthia, Haley, Tony, thanks for joining us. So I know we have a bunch of folks that are registered, so I know that most of those folks will be here shortly. As we get started, we have just a couple of housekeeping things for the folks that are watching absolutely live. If you're watching from YouTube, there is a chat function for Q&A that I will be keeping an eye on. And if you're on Zoom because you registered, you are going to be getting not only the ability to chat via either the webinar chat tool or Q&A to ask questions as we go through, but you're also going to be getting an email after this with overview. And if you would like um, a copy of today's deck or any of the resources that we're going to work through, we will also be sending those your way via email. So welcome, everybody. Super excited to have you here. As we get started, let's uh, introduce ourselves, Trigvi. Um, of course, BusyWeb is a marketing agency in Minneapolis, and we focus primarily on inbounds and sales enablement for our B2B slash um, manufacturing clients. And so what that means for us is that we do all of the things that drive traffic to a business, ad advertising, SEO, um, email marketing, content, blog posts, but then we take it into HubSpot, which is our tool of choice for sales enablement, where we'll help automate and turn that into a choose your own adventure so that you're actively and proactively engaging your customers as you go. I am Dave. I'm the owner and founder of BusyWeb since 99. So we're moving into our 25th year here. And as always, I am joined by Trigvi, who is our lead buzz development director, aka the sales guru. Trigvi, tell us a little hey, bit. Hey, I am uh, I am the head of sales at BusyWeb. In addition to uh, help one of the producers and hosts of the podcast, along with Dave, and uh, also uh, I am an adjunct professor at HubSpot Academy. In addition to everything else, I do at BusyWeb. Amazing. Yes. And that's kind of one of the things that we should probably get started on as we're talking about persona marketing. Um, kind of, at least from the outside looking in, you would figure that Dave and Trigvi are relatively similar and we might even apply under the same persona. So, you know, what, you know, uh, upper 40s now, um, <laughs> Minnesota. We're, we're push, pushing 50 harder every day. <laughs> Um, marketing, marketing eyed, um, executive kind of focused, but there are of course quite a few differences in the way we interact. So like Trigvi, um, you're a sports guy. Yep. I'm you're, more, uh, you're a car guy. Yep. Yep. So I like zipping around and, and tinkering and turning wrenches. Uh, we both do enjoy um, working with wood, although I think you're quite a bit more talented than I am in that regard with some of the projects I've seen you build. Um, and so there's definitely differences in who we are and probably differences in what we're looking to accomplish in our jobs, which is yeah, probably I, I, one of the most important parts. I think that's the, one of the critical things that we're going to talk about today. It's, 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 so this is going to be a unique experience because it's going to be two guys who are going to talk a lot about feelings. <laughs> and and how, how, how making people feel a certain way. And so one of the reasons why this is such a critical part of marketing, Dave, is this is so so uh, this is such a valuable tool that touches so many different parts of the organization because this is really one of the times you get to choose who you get to work with. Uh, and it's it's one of those things that you not you're not just set with everybody. So what we wanted to start talking about is really what is it, what exactly does a persona, what is a persona and how, how do you use it in marketing is just sort of level setting and making sure that the, the nomenclature we're using is the same ones that everybody understands. So we're going to start with a really scary statistic, which is um, more often than not, you will spend more time with the people that you work with than the people that you love or your family. 
And that's that's a hard truth and a harsh truth for a lot of people. And so one of the reasons why so many people change jobs all the time is because they are looking for that sense of happiness and they don't have it. Mm-hmm. But fortunately, in the marketing and in the sales realm, we actually do get to choose that. So one of the things that as you're starting to think, well, what is this persona thing and why is it relevant? Why should we even care? Is because you get to, you're empowered to work with the people that you want to work with and ask yourself the question, who's really your favorite customer and who's the person that you you really like working with? And that's not necessarily your buddy or somebody that pays you the most, but it's things like, who is the person that you 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 look at your calendar as you're lying in bed first thing in the morning and you say, man, I can't, oh, thank goodness. I get, I get to go work with Sarah today and I get to go talk to Sarah today. And you're genuinely proud of the things that you've done. So at the end of the day, when you're sitting with your family having dinner again and they say, well, what happened in your day? And that's, what are the things that you want to tell them? Who are the people that you've interacted? And, uh, you know, I think the, especially when I talk, we just talk about marketing is, who are the people that you really want to write a case study for to say that, hey, this is the people that th- this is somebody that we've done uh, really amazing work for and right. that we're, we're really proud of. That's that's what a favorite customer really is. And so what our goal on the front end of the customer journey and the buyer's journey is how do we help replicate those favorite customers? into more and more and more favorite customers. We do that by creating a persona. And what exactly is a persona? Well, it's that favorite customer, but it's semi-fictionalized. So it talks about things like um, who they are, what their frustrations are, what their wants are, what their needs are. And that's based some on, on market research, but it's also based on real data on those existing customers, because those are the people that matter the most to you, not in, again, not on a balance sheet necessarily, but the people that uh, from a longevity standpoint and an excitement standpoint, you really want to work with. For sure. So as we build this, um, you know, one of the big questions is, of course, who is a persona? So Trigvi, when we're doing this conversation, how do we interact or how do we help our clients choose what a persona is? So one of the first questions that we ask is who are you selling to? Mm -hmm. And that's usually really telling because sometimes what what we'll get is, and we'll say, well, somebody will say, well, we'll, we're selling to everybody, which isn't actually true. Unless you're selling food, love or warmth, you're not, you're not universally selling to everybody. But instead, there are people that need your product and service, and which is a spectrum of people. And then there are, are, are people who are in a place where they're looking to buy now and actively in the buying cycle. That's about 10% of that spectrum. And then about 90% of the spectrum is considering it because everybody always wants to look for and see how do they get something better. So as you're considering who your favorite customer is, you got to realize that there are a whole bunch of other people out there that look like that person and act like that person, that if you just talk to them in the way in which they want to be talked to, then they're really going to be excited about talking to you and really be excited about how you can potentially solve the problems that they might not even know that they have yet. Mm-hmm. So when we ask the question, the, the second question is, is tell us about your favorite customer. Who right. are they? What do they like? Mm-hmm. And sometimes people say, oh, this is the person that I make the most money at. That's not the most important because you can make more money if uh, then uh, in in 12 months than you can in one month if you continue to give that person a good service. And part of that is it's, it's an equitable relationship is you're continuing to give better service because your people are engaged because they like working with that person. They feel accomplishment. They feel like they're doing great things because they're working together on that. Absolutely. Uh, fun fun fact about this slide, Trigby, as, as we're talking through. Um, the image on the slide I actually created using ChatSpot. And Did you really? Build me a marketing persona graphic with several options for different kinds of personality types. Oh, <laughs> that's awesome. That is. That was pretty fun. Yeah. So why why even use personas then? You know, we're talking fictionalized things. Why why yep. go 
general versus, you know, I want to keep marketing to Bob? So that's a great question because it really depends if you have a specific need set that you want then there there are specific ways in which you you want to sell to people and specific ways in which you want to talk to people so again we talked initially about the differences between you and i so Mm -hmm. if you're selling a high performance automobile then you're not selling to me because i'm never going to buy a high performance automobile because other than putting gas in the car and being aware that there is an engine eh, i'm not really a good fit for those kind of things How, and i don't really like to go fast it's one of the things that as i've got gone over 45 i've come to realize is that that i am terrified of roller coasters and heights for some reason mm-hmm. you on the other hand love it and yeah. and 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 drive uh, like a high performance driver because you've been trained in it and that's exciting to you and you're th- monitoring it and you know of it. So it's just even, you know, hey, am I going to sell the guys? Well, you could sell, you could probably sell you and I the same grill, but would yeah. you sell us the same car? No. So number one, it, it provides you with a context of really who is going to be your most ideal buyer. Right. It's going to be harder to sell me a high performance automobile than it is going to sell you, for, for instance. Sure. So yeah. as we're looking, part of part of what we're looking for in the sales and marketing realm after this is who is how are we gonna how are we gonna make speed on this? And so finding the people who are most interested is perfect. The second is those people who are going to be really excited about wanting to work with you are, are going to be the people who are going to matter the most because they're not only going to buy once, but they're going to buy many, many times. Mm-hmm. So by focusing on Dave, as opposed to I want to sell to men, then all of a sudden, when you have an understanding of what Dave is and what Dave's motivation is and what Dave really wants out of an experience, not just what does he want from a transactional experience, what does he want overall, then all of a sudden you have a much better idea because you're not talking to everybody that you're talking to Dave. And when you're writing a blog, you're writing to Dave. And when you're writing a, a social post, you're writing it to Dave. Because the more that you focus on that, the more often than not, the people who fit that category and fit that 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 that, that niche, uh, the more they're more likely going to be interested in learning more which means that they're going to ingest more content, which means that they're going to throw up a hand and say, hey, I'd be interested in learning a little bit more. So finally, the last thing and the most important thing is that it it, it helps make marketing so much more effective. So instead of trying to cover a broad range and sort of spraying and praying, you're really focused only on the people that you're going to be, that you're really going to want to talk to. Now, the challenge is that it often means that your numbers are going to skew down, but it means your sales are going to skew up because you're not focused on getting everybody to look at you. You're only focused on the people you want to get to look at you. Absolutely. So the next question then is how do we get started with these personas. And so as we as we walk through this next step, we're going to get a little bit tactical. So for our attendees, for folks watching, um, you may actually want to have a either either notes or a spare window to open up some of the resources that we're going to share. Um, feel free and and remember if you if you're live attending today, you you uh, actually registered for today's event, you're going to get an email with these links. So you don't need to scramble too hard, but the the goal when we're getting started with building personas, with starting to target our actual customers and who we can best fit is, of course, to have the right business goals. You know, I like talking about smart goals, and it's kind of one of those chi- tired tropes of the business world, You know, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-based goals. What we really mean by having the right goals for your business is every business has probably one massive goal and that's to make money for its owners or its shareholders. If you're a nonprofit, sometimes that goal is to get more engagement, more volunteer time, more impact in the community, but you want more of something. Our job as marketers as sales team to try and influence and how we want to look at this as we're building personas is to say, who are the people that are going to make the most difference to our business? 
it might be someone that has the biggest project with you or makes the biggest orders. If you're retail focused, it might be folks that are frequent purchasers, but it also might be the ones that wind up being not just the biggest dollar figures, but the biggest profit. So if you have folks that you can sign and that are going to buy a big program with you, if you're in B2B and they're going to place a large order, but they're also very low maintenance, that might be a fantastic person to have, right? So if on the other side, you have someone that is going to make a big order, but they're going to be calling you seven times a week, then that might not be your ideal customer because you're going to get completely overrun with people and interactions with those people if you get too many of that kind of person. And that might be the difference between a tactical person inside of a business versus more of an executive level person. So that's just different decisions, different needs, different points of reference that they're looking for. So as there's we also, look at this, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. There's also something to be said for, I, I think for as, as you are, 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 are doing this is there's also, and this doesn't fit into the smart goals mindset, but it fits into the people mindset. Mm-hmm. So in my job as head of sales is, 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 I want to help the the people that I work with get get some things that are fun and interesting. So every once in a while, even though it's not a great fit for us, uh, if if they're if they're great people and they will refer us business on a mm-hmm. regular basis, which sort of gets into that mindset of what makes that great customer, right. uh, then um, yeah, then we'll we'll consider doing it. I think one of the um, uh, I think most famous examples of this is, is we once did a website for a, a world champion juggling troupe, which doesn't really fit into our B2B mindset, but everybody who worked on the product had a gas and they did a really great job on it. And that site continues to refer us business. Mm-hmm. For sure. So as you look at this, then, you know, not, not just having the right goals in mind for your business, you also need to think about what the journey is that your buyers are taking. And I'm going to get a little bit um, deep in the strategy or in the, in the higher touch parts of marketing for a second, but bear with me because I think it's interesting as an exercise, as you're thinking about who you're reaching to understand where they are in their decision process. So there's three phases of most buyer's journeys. And that's awareness, where they've just identified that they have a problem. Consideration, they're starting to narrow down who can help solve that problem. And then decision. So you're trying to get them to close, to fill out a contact us form, to buy if it's a retail decision. If we took this into real life, if you're having a problem with plumbing, right? So my pipes are leaking, should I, I should get that fixed. That's awareness stage. I should hire a plumber, but which one? And then decision, I'm hiring, in this case, Dave's Plumbing, because they are the right person for this. So you need to think of not only just the persona of that person, but where they might be when they're engaging with you. Most folks have already identified their need in awareness, but they're probably looking then for you at the consideration stage. And that's a different conversation the awareness stage is more identifying the problem. So we help people with leaky pipes. Consideration, we have the expertise to help you get your pipes fixed. And here are some things you need to consider. And decision, here's why you should trust us and let's do business. I think so, what's interesting about yeah. this is, is that oftentimes there are uh, you know, we're giving obviously a very simplified example here, but in, in any problem, there's off, there's often a set, set of sense of nuance mm-hmm. that there are potential solutions to many different potential solutions to a problem. And so uh, I, I think what's great about the marketing aspect and the sales and marketing aspect of the, the, the customer the buyer's journey is it, it helps them identify which is the best one for them. Mm -hmm. So it's not just here are five examples is it really good marketing gets into under helping that customer understand why they need what they need and what they need beyond that. So as really the ask that you're making of people is, Hey, let's start a relationship either, you know, trust me to, to, to fix your problem, give me some money to help do it. 
But in order to get there, you have to feel really good about it. And so it, it's often a, a solution is not absolute. Often there are different kinds of solutions. But uh, as you lay this out, Dave, it's really important that folks realize that what is the best solution for them is the most important thing, because there's right. often several different solutions to a problem. For sure. So without further ado, we promised to get you started with applying personas. Let's dig in. So first, of course, you need to gather information about the kinds of customers that you want to target. We talked already about the buyer's journey and where they need to be, kind of the differences between your best customer and your biggest customer. But you need to get the information that you need in order to start creating a profile of that absolute perfect best customer, that mythical customer. So you're going to use surveys, interviews with your best customers, uh, existing paid people. Um, look into your CRM and look at who those people are. I'm going to give you a couple of tips into how to apply um, personas to your actual CRM in HubSpot, if you're a HubSpot user. But then again, you're looking for the needs, the goals, and where they hang out because you're trying to get into their head and almost think about, okay, if I was this person, what would I be Googling for? What would I be looking for? What would perk my ears if I was actually interested in the thing that we do for our customers? So we like to use HubSpot for this. And there's some absolutely brilliant tools that I want to walk through quickly with you. And the first of those is to use the Make My, Pers Make My Persona tool. Literally, if you just go to makemypersona.com, you'll be walked through a series of seven steps to help you build your first persona. It's very easy. And there's actually some details and some content. I'm going to show you how to put it into HubSpot in a moment. But you just hey, Dave, go to, yeah. I wanted to point something out too. This is an absolutely free tool. Yes, completely free. And so is HubSpot, by the way, yeah. at this level. So everything that we're talking about here, you don't need to pay more for so if you are in HubSpot, again, getting a little bit nerdy for a second, but if you go into settings, which is the gear in HubSpot, I'm kind of in the top right in the black bar, and then go to properties down the left, and then contact properties, and then personas, you'll be able to create personas, and then you can apply those people, your best people, to your personas and start looking at, okay, are these people actually converting? And then you can go in inside of the contact record, inside of the marketing. And if someone replies or looks into your company, you can assign that person a persona so you can see if you're actually engaging with them. So I want to do this like I'm, I'm just going to scroll into and, and open up a different window for a second. This is what making persona looks like. But as we go into the actual agency tool or inside of the tool for making your persona. This is a deeper dive into what the personas do. So, and there's a link right inside of this personas thing to the make my persona tool, but you can see you're giving the name of that person. I like being alliterative. So agency owner, Aaron, the description, you get this through the steps in the make my persona tool, their roles, their goals. Again, what makes them successful when they work with you? their challenges, demographics, um, kind of their income range, what their education is, and then their story. So the story is kind of an interesting, fun part about that. So this is what it looked like after I went through the Make My Persona tool. And I want to go back to- And Dave, why is, why is the story important? Yeah, the story is just how you internalize as you're creating content for your customers what you need to do. So you can almost think of personas as little little crib notes when you're about to write a letter to your best customer. And your blog posts, your social media posts, your advertising, you can think of as love letters to your favorite people, to the people that are going to be best for your business. So if you wanted to make a persona, this is a super easy way. You got to make mypersona.com. And then I'm going to walk you through the seven steps quickly so that you get an idea of how easy this is. So you go to makemypersona.com. And then your first step is to create an avatar. 
So you're going to call them something. I like doing something alliterative. So manufacturer Mike in this case, and then it walks you right into their demographic traits. So kind of how old are they? And this is general, right? So it's, it's, you're not going to avoid or not talk to anyone that's 34 or 45 or older. You're going to kind of generalize and say, okay, well, at 35 to 44, they probably have these things going on in their lives. They probably have kids. Those kids are probably in somewhere in the middle of their schooling. So probably between elementary school and middle school and they've probably completed some level of education and you're just kind of going to going to kind of give a round answer from that, there. I mean, that kind of thing is important down line because, you know, if you're dealing with people who have kids, you know, that matters because it means that there there's a time when they need to switch work off and, and go do other things. And that is one of the motivators too. Why do they get up in the morning and go to work? It's because they've got kids and they want to provide for their kids. So that little piece of detail provides you several layers of motivation beyond just that they have kids. Right. So as you're looking through that, of course, the next step in that person's role, what industry are they in? What size is their organization? And then what's their job title? Again, director of manufacturing. Um, how is their job measured by the amount of new projects that they bring in? Who do they report to? This is important because you need to know what kinds of information or data that they need to bring to their bosses in order to make a compelling case to work with you. Less important if you're a retail focused in, in or person because then it's usually a smaller buy and you, it's not like they have to go to their bosses all the time. Unless, of course, it's a spousal relationship and they need to clear things with their spouse before they make a major life or family purchase. In that case, it might be like for buying a car, right? So you probably have to incorporate the needs or the thoughts of someone's significant other before they go out and buy that next dream vehicle. And then once they're past career, they go into characteristics of their actual job. So what their goals or objectives are, there's actually a huge long list inside of this one, which I love. It's just simple, simple check boxes, and it helps fill it out. And then how they work. So the kinds of tools that they use, you're looking for the kinds of tools that they use and where they hang out online so that you can give them some of those things or understand how they interact with the world or the buckets that they put things in as they're doing their information gathering. Right. So Trigby, I know we've we've done this a lot with our clients. Any big gotchas as people are looking at the kinds of tools that they're looking at? Uh, I, I think eh, tools is such a hard thing to to consider because people mm -hmm. um everybody always looks for a new new shiny thing. You know, mm -hmm. I know this is a, a unique time of year for you and I, especially because we are Apple nerds and every uh, every month, uh, every year, they come up with a new iPhone, and and you and I are usually the first in line. And it's usually, you know, a, a couple of minor little things, but you and I are, are often agog about it. Mm -hmm. But what, similarly, what you see is is you see a whole lot of other people who will advertise, "Hey, we do this one thing better than the iPhone." Well, that's great. That's probably true, but that's that doesn't mean you should buy it because that means that iPhone does everything else better than you, and right. so. Being aware of how a tool fits in, and I th it is really important. I think, especially if you're selling something that has uh, a a, um, a long lead time, or mm -hmm. uh, it, it, the the opportunity cost of asking somebody to switch a tool, uh, you really need to be be considerate of that too. Right, and the same vein, you know, if if we look at bigger buckets. Um, I cut off the screen a little bit too too high there, but those icons on how they prefer to communicate with vendors or other businesses. Crucial. It's yeah. phone, email, text messaging, social media, um, just Googling for them. That helps you get an idea for how are they looking? Because if you dis if you discover or in looking and in interviewing your best customers, they never look at text messages or they only look at text messages. 
you need to either get yourself a tool that's going to use those or focus on something else that you know that they're using. So the, the I just I just step, well, right. we I just closed a deal recently where I would say two thirds of the communication I had, and, and it was with an older gentleman. He was uh, uh, over fifty. Um, two thirds of the communication and the negotiation happened over text. Mm-hmm. Yep, and it's just different, right? Yeah. So you need to take it take care to be where those people are to speak the language that they need to hear and to get the information in front of them that they need to make the decision to either continue their research process with you, to visit more pages of your website, to engage, to do the true inbound journey where they're downloading a form or attending an event, and then getting the opportunity to deepen their relationship or to research further by help that you're giving them. So if you know that they're interested in widget X, giving them a spec sheet for widget X so that they understand what they're getting into, or here are some common issues or some common things that have been helpful in the choosing process can be incredibly helpful in building trust and getting accountability and getting that next step. So you wind up with the persona overview, and then again, you're going to import that into the HubSpot persona tool to verify and to attach two individual contacts so that you know if you're hitting that persona and or how to tweak that persona because you said we we figured that they were super interested in text messaging and we're not getting any hit rate once we text them or we're finding a massive amount of unsubscribes we thought they would be huge into video but nobody's checking out our channel or whatever right so let's let's look a little deeper and talk through a couple of personas that busyweb has built And again, reminder to our folks that are watching our attendees, feel free to ask us questions. And if you want to ask live and just talk instead of typing, um, if you use Zoom's tool to just raise your hands, we can turn on your microphone as well. But let's talk through a couple. Trigvi, why don't you take marketing manager Marissa and explain who she is? This is somebody that we are actively, this is somebody as we are trying to market our business is somebody that we try and think, consider is, is how do we... How do we talk to Marissa? So we've broken this down into a couple of categories, all of which uh, I, I think uh, you notice are, are, are not, are not hard, uh, hardcore factual. So what does she want? What does she need? What are, is she frustrated with? And what are some key questions that she's going to come to the, to the table with? And I think one of the things that, as you consider per, personas, um, I think there, there's this great, wonderful sort of bedrock movie that a lot of, of, of people uh, t- talk about. It's a, it's a movie called Rashomon, and it was been done by a Japanese filmmaker named Akira Kurosawa. And really what it is, is it's an examination of one specific event that happens from four different people's viewpoints and how that, that the event itself changed based on who was looking at it. And so when we're thinking about Marissa, what we're not thinking about is what is fact, it's, it's what does she believe and what is she coming to the table with uh, and, and her perception and her uh, point of view of what are things that she's concerned about. So you can see the first thing in the wants and needs, especially in the marketing world for us, Dave, is there is a ton of new technology that comes up all the time. And so it's almost a full-time job just to stay uh, yeah. up on that. Um, and similarly, what is the newest, you know, from a key questions and ideas perspective, how do you stay on top of what's the newest thing in the marketing world? You know, one of the things that's really big right now in the marketing world is, is is using AI enablement tools to make your job quicker and faster. How do you take advantage of that? How do you use that? What are the risks associated with that? When when Marissa asks those three questions immediately, what she's really asking is, what is my risk tolerance in, in adoption of this tool? Right. What, am I going to get Am I going to get dinged if I put my name behind this and say that this is something I want to do and I want to go forward with? Right. So, and then similarly, frustrations, that tells you a lot about where she's coming to because she wants to avoid those. So things like um, uh, knowing what's the right one for the company, again, that speaks to her motivation is she's wanting to make a good decision because 
it's not her money that she's spending, but it is her value to the company if she doesn't spend the money wisely. So that's what her real concern is, is making sure that she's looking like a hero. Right. Next, what also is really important, Dave, is, is the awareness and the engagement, because it shows how people engage things and, and where do you talk to them. In Marissa's case, she's big on social media and public relations, but she's not big on traditional ads. So as we try and, and market to her, we're not really doing a lot of traditional ads, but we are putting a lot on social media. We're doing events like this, etc. And then similarly, um, what is the tool that she uses to engage with? You know, she's not a big tablet person. Typically, you see tablets as uh, people who are in the field a lot, uh, either mm -hmm. uh, like hard, uh, like salespeople will use tablets, especially if they have to do presentations in the field or people who are doing a lot of estimating. So like roofers use tablets uh, and siding people use tablets all the time. But Marissa's probably uh, in, an, in an office most of the time, which is why her desktop and her laptop uh, are her biggest uh, places of engagement followed by her cell phone. Right. And as, as we look at this, I want to do a, a side track again in here to, you know, if we look at BusyWeb's actual communications, if I go into our blog, you can see that most of what we write is guarantee or is, is kind of targeted at Marissa. So what is HubSpot consulting and do you need it? Marketing attribution reporting, what matters? Why your inbound emails suck, right? So going in and saying, this is what's important for this person for marketing manager Marissa can be incredibly helpful and important so that you know what you're getting into. So that's part of why we write what we write. And part of why we create webinars like these to help engage marketing manager marissa also so uh, before you go back before we go back to the deck dave uh just quick mm -hmm. cheap plug dial it in season two available wherever you get your podcasts yeah. absolutely um okay so looking at then a different person so this is someone that is for one of our clients so just marketing manager, uh, sales manager, Scott is a little bit older, has a bachelor's degree, married, um, personality is persistent, confident, goal-oriented, friendly, and meticulous. So those are the kinds of things that we try to address or the kinds of tone that we try to take. And one of the questions that he wants to get answered is he just wants to stay up to date on the latest sales trends that affect the way he does his job so that he can make the best decisions for his company. So he has slightly more revenue titled or revenue leaning questions that he needs answered. And he has almost identical engagement and awareness spots, but he's interested in an entirely different kind of thing. And again, if I go back to our posts, you know, our Facebook ad still worth it for businesses. Um, that's something a little bit different than so Marissa is probably looking for. What is HubSpot Consulting? Why your emails suck? And our sales manager, Scott, is probably looking for you know, three pitfalls to avoid with AI or things to do now before universal analytics. Well, that's more Marissa. But how to follow up with leads immediately with HubSpot, that's a Scott-facing post, right? So he's looking for details. So what is HubSpot? How to set up your lead management system? How to set up automated emails? How to schedule personalized phone calls, et cetera. So that's more of what Scott's looking for. So I want to take some time to get into the questions. And again, as we go through questions, we have some folks that are live here, and I want to give you priority because you're here live. So if you have additional questions, feel free to either use chat or the Q&A tool, or if you're on YouTube and watching us live, to enter it in the chat function inside of the YouTube live video. But let's go through a few, and let's just take every other one, Trevi. Why don't you take the first one? What is marketing strategy? So uh, what what I like to answer my, my I like to answer that question is 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 as follows is you know you and I Dave are, are in the Twin Cities here in Minneapolis in St Paul and uh, if we have a goal that we want to drive to Chicago mm -hmm. there are a hundred different ways that we can get to Chicago from here all of which are correct eventually we will end up in Chicago. 
However, one of them is the uh, quickest from a time perspective and also the most efficient use of resources in order to accomplish the goal. So one of the things that we almost insist upon is um, building out that plan on how do we get people to Chicago? What is your goal? How are we going to get there? And then what are what are the ways in which we are going to do take to do that? Because what are the ways that matter to you? And so that's all everything that goes into a marketing strategy is really answering the question, how do you move the needle and get from where you are to where you want to be and using marketing in, in, in order to do that? For sure. For sure. Love that. So um, how does UX reach the desired audience? UX is user experience or how people interact with your business, with your audience, with your website. So user experience and the design of your website is an entire field of psychology and um, user interactions that you, can, that you can lean on. And you need to have a great designer and someone that's thoughtful about, is this, you know, it's so for marketing manager or sales manager, Scott, he works most on his phone because he's on the road, he's, he's helping sell. So we need to make sure that our website looks and works great on mobile devices. And so we need to have our mobile tools almost prominent or first and foremost and designed for mobile first if we want to really, really reach Scott. I love talking about user experience oh, because yeah. this, is, this is something that I often use to weed out people that aren't good fits for BusyWeb mm -hmm. when they explain that user experience, they don't need user experience. They've not, that that's not important. And that it, the greatest example of user experience is that uh, if you've ever bought something on Amazon, it's uh, universally four clicks to purchase. <laughs> and so it, cause it's meant to be easy, find the thing you need faster than any way figure out the way to, to simplify the buying process as easy as possible, one, two, three, and you're done. And so in building out a user experience, that's the model that everybody sort of universally understands now is, is that quickness. How quick is your experience and how seamless is your experience? Absolutely. Um, how often do we need to revise personas whenever they start feeling stale? Right. And also when, uh, if, if sales are lagging, if the people yeah. that it, it, it could be that you've fished out the pond and there's, there's not that out much opportunity left in the area that you're in, mm -hmm. uh, especially as you're trying to focus on uh, niche marketing, uh, oftentimes you do have to have to revise that. But what typically follows after you make your initial personas is that you realize that um, even uh, you move to uh, account-based marketing where you realize that account an account might be a, a good fit but within that account then you have to have several kinds of personas like the marketing manager the sales manager the finance manager all of which need to have their own personas as well so i would say it's good to look at about every six months from geographically uh, but i think also to, to to your point dave yeah if they're feeling stale or if you feel like you're you're not connecting with them the numbers don't support it then it's time to revise right so this one's kind of fun, and I know exactly who asked this question. It's one of our clients that is a television studio. So what's the best persona for a small media company? This one's interesting because it's not as targeted as we can be with most B2B. So if we're in manufacturing and we have a specific kind of manufacturing that we do, say it's medical device manufacturing, you're probably dealing with doctors or engineers that are looking for a specific thing. If you're trying to reach a broad audience, you probably, like you just said, Trigby, you need to have four or five different personas for the kinds of people that are going to engage with your business. So small media company, local cable television station, you're probably looking at people that are going to be around their house. So probably folks that are either working from home or that are stay-at-home parents. You're probably during specific times of day, right? You probably are looking for folks that are parents of high school age kids that have televised sporting events. And you're probably looking for folks that are very engaged or interested in local government and are going to be tuning in. So you're looking at, in that case, at probably someone kind of 
not necessarily older, but probably has a little bit more time on their hands, maybe a lot more of the retired community in your local area, um, folks that are very interested in where their money and their taxes are going, right? So um, all of those need to be accounted for. The trick is you need to strike a balance between exactly the people that are your best fits and covering the bases for your company, which kind of leads into that last one. How do we create a concise statement so people what we know what we do? You have to pick enough that you're covering your entire audience, but be limited enough so that you don't try to be everything to everyone. I have so many so, thoughts on this. Yeah, let's let's dig deeper. And my again, questions, uh, stop them here or raise your hand if you want to ask live. I have an actor friend who's also a motivational uh, a speaker about this, and he has a great term for this. Is is with it is so often companies have a bad case of weemi ias, yeah. which is uh, it is a, a made up word, but it, it 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 they they spend too much time talking about what we do and what's important about me and how I want you to buy from me because of things that we've done in the past and how great us as a company is. That's we, me, I, us. And so my answer to the question is, number one is avoid that at all costs because cool. talking about you is just talking about you. When people are asking, uh, wanting to know what you do, what they're really asking isn't what you do, it's what problem do you solve? Right. And so that's how I would reframe the question is what problem do you solve and who do you solve it for? Uh, the second thing is, is I think, uh, as the, the, the questioner asked, is narrow your focus appropriately. So as Dave said at the beginning of the hour, one of the things that BusyWeb does is we focus on helping B2B companies grow. People who focus on selling, who have a business and focus on selling to other businesses. Um, and that's something that um, we're pretty, we're really good at. Um, can we do other things? Yes, we can. Can we build you a great big e-commerce platform? Yes. Is that something that we do all the time and we really look for? And could you potentially find a better fit elsewhere? Yeah, yeah, maybe. So we be honest with what who you are and what kind of business that you're looking for, because again, that focuses on what you do and the kind of business, repeat business that you want over and over and over again. The third thing, and this is where Dave and I tend to uh, uh, diverge, is I really don't like uh, wordsmithing. And, mm -hmm. and Dave loves wordsmithing. And I think the, the most plain language that you can get to so people can easily understand it as possible. So one yeah. of the things that I would tell you to avoid is like um, one of the I, I, often, if, if you're describing things that also apply to your dog, don't do that. So, <laughs> you know, I have, a, I have a dog and his name is Moose. And, you know, he, you could describe him as a go-getter. He loves, because if you throw something, he'll go get it and bring it back to you. Or uh, he has great customer service because, you know, it, he's, he's very attentive all the time. So make he's sure loyal. that your word, yeah, make sure that your words are specific and, and roll up to the overall idea of really what, who are you helping and why? That's, that's how I would answer that question. For sure. For sure. Um, we do, we have had some additional attendees pop on since um, we started. So if you do have specific questions about personas, now's your chance, either pop them into chat or use the Zoom tool to raise your hand and we'd be happy to answer your questions live on air. Um, I do. Dave, I have a, I have a, I have a question that uh, yeah, for, for you is, is I know that you and I uh, hear this all the time is people say, oh, no, no, no. I know, I know who our best customer is. Mm -hmm. What can you talk a little bit about the importance of going through the exercise and actually writing it down? What's the value for that? What is, what does somebody get from actually having that down written on paper? Right. I think the, the specific answer that you just gave about, we know our customers is usually done by the owner of the company or someone in charge of revenue. And the problem with them thinking that they know who your customer is, is that they're assuming things that not everyone in the organization probably agrees with. So if 
you think that you have a great idea about who your customer is and what really makes them tick and the kinds of questions they're asking. If you haven't all agreed all the way down to your frontline employees that are actually interacting with your team, with your customers, you're missing out on important questions and you're probably making assumptions based on who you are more than who your customer is. So you you nailed it just a minute ago, Trigby. Uh, if you can say the same